So, I'm, I'm very um, privileged to be sitting here with Natan. Um, and just before we start talking about basically anything we want to, uh, and we'll try and leave some time for questions, I, I thought we should probably work out who's here and where you're from, not like one at a time, because that would be, be the whole evening. But just show our hands if you're here for the GA, I guess, from abroad, right? Wow. So that's, that's not who you are. So who's everybody else? Okay, not one at a time, but just give me some idea. Oh, I see, and you saw, and this was advertised where? How did you get to this then? Email. Email, Times of Israel, good, good, excellent. Okay, <laughs> and, and how, because we, we won't talk about all the, okay. And um, heard Nathan speak before, raise your hands. Okay, um, okay, so, so. So you, but I didn't listen, hear you. I'm asking that question. I'm not gonna ask that question. I'm gonna ask Nathan if he's gonna play the piano for us. Well, in the Soviet Union, uh, in Jewish families, in my time, every girl had to learn piano. Ten years of school, ten years of piano, four girls. But boys were supposed to study math, physics, chess, so that's why I don't play piano. My wife does. <laughs> I, I, I once played you at chess, and, and maybe I'm misremembering it. I know I lost, I think we played maybe a couple of times, I know I lost one, but I, I, is it possible that I do with you again at chess? Not possible, right? Well, uh, our ambassador in Washington is telling to everybody very proudly that he has beaten Sharansky. But he, then he forgets to say that it was Hannah Sharansky when she was four years old. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, that's the light entertainment for the evening, and now we're going to talk very serious stuff. So I, I, I wanted to ask you this, and a lot of you have heard Nathan speak before and maybe know a lot of his life story, but nonetheless, um, really into the nitty-gritty of the conversations that a lot of people are having uh, around the GA this week and, uh, and in the Israel diaspora relationship, this is an event where we're speaking English and so on. So, you know, as somebody whose insistent desire on coming to live in Israel um, led to you being uh, sent to the Gulag for almost a decade, when you now see Israel and the diaspora in a, in a relationship where there is tension and there are efforts to, to heal, that there are things that need healing, how does that, how does that make you feel? Uh, well, I'm concerned. I'm not concerned with the fact that there are tensions and disagreements. Those who think that in the times of trouble for Soviet Jewry, everything was nice, so it doesn't know how many debates and arguments and internal fightings were between us about strategy, about tactics, uh, quiet diplomacy, not quiet diplomacy, to fight only for those who want to go to Israel or for everybody to connect with human rights, not to connect. They were very serious and uh, bitter debates and sometimes uh, you have to pay a price for it. I'm not concerned about it. I think it's very healthy that we have so many different opinions. What I'm really concerned that then, when we had these debates, there was permanent debate, permanent discussion. Uh, there were so many different Soviet Jewish organizations fighting with one another, but they all came to Brussels conference and they all discussed. They, uh, there was opportunity always to hear the opinion of the other and to appreciate that, after all, there is place for everybody. We almost stopped talking to one another. Uh, more and more American Jews stop understanding our challenges in security, and more and more Israelis don't understand the challenges of uh, pluralism in America and why, why we need it. So, okay, the, the fact that there are different opinions about it is okay. The fact that we don't have serious, deep exchange of opinions about it, that's very a lot. That's a, you know, that's a really bleak picture, you say have almost stopped talking. It, well, I don't, know, I don't know how to ask you how to fix that. Is, are there mechanisms that we don't have? Do we need to, to institutionalize channels of dialogue because, because well, everything is breaking down? Well, first of all, what is breaking down? I, I, I'm a big optimist. We are, uh, uh, Israel is unbelievable success, first of all, unbelievable success in the world. And we are uh, the only democracy in the most non-democratic part of the world. And we are 
and the free world may be the most strong national state. So it's huge achievement uh, to be Jewish democratic state when the free world is abandoned in nationalism and when the Middle East abandoned uh, democracy and we are doing both. So we are huge success economically, socially and, and of course in terms of our strength of our security. But we, uh, Israel is supposed to be the home of all the Jews of the world. And everybody says it with a big price. My friend Prime Minister oh, doesn't think in a moment that Israel is not home for every Jew. But to be home for every Jew, most Israelis don't want to understand. That means that we welcome Jews with their rabbis, with their prayers, with uh, their communities. And that's why when the government had, after many years of very difficult negotiations, reached compromise about, let's say, prayer the court. And then very easily to, to push it down, its own decision. And uh, as I saw very clearly, ministers simply don't understand what it really means for many communities in the world. It's the fact that even ministers uh, know so little about diaspora Jewry. And they appear on all these conferences all the time. But, so it means that there is no serious discussion about this on all the levels where decisions are made. Or, let's say, just recently, there is a big debate about BDS law. When the, uh, you know, we expect from all Jewry to fight BDS day and night, and correctly so. And I'm very proud that uh, I sent 100 shlichim to campuses to fight BDS. But when the law about BDS is discussed in Knesset, didn't they think they had to invite somebody who is fighting BDS to ask, do they need this law? Will it be helpful? I can tell you, from all my 100 shlichim in the campus, I don't see even one who will say that this law helped him. So the fact that we are making a very serious decision and we expect the old jury to use our decisions for, for our sake, and we don't ask them. Uh, well, of course, I have a lot of criticism also about American jury. The fact that uh, so many of my liberal American friends cannot say what a great thing is to move embassy uh, to, to Jerusalem only because it was moved by President Trump and not President Obama. It's absolutely ridiculous. I had such a long conversation with my friends, how it can be? So, but it simply, it simply reminds us how we, before expressing our position, very important issues of our relations, we don't discuss it between ourselves. Okay, so I want to pick up on, on a couple of the things you said there already. So we, the, the BDS uh, situation came to a head in the last few weeks because uh, a BDS activist or a previous BDS activist was, was prevented from coming in and then um, allowed in by the Supreme Court. So we're in the area of kind of um, criticism and dissent and opposition. You, you oppose the law, you oppose its use in the case of Lara Al-Qassam just now. Do you feel that our democracy is robust enough that every, even the most bitter critics, we should be able to let in? Or where, you know, where and how do you draw some of those lines? Well, first of all, uh, we as a sovereign state have the full right to defend ourselves and to decide who is welcomed and who is not welcomed. By the way, when America says somebody no, that doesn't give them visa. America doesn't come even to explain this. And I have to say, a number of times I tried to help the people who were refused to come as tourists to America, and they failed. You cannot, the Secretary of State cannot help you. If the immigration authorities in America said no, they don't have to explain anything. So I don't feel that uh, we have to apologize to anyone, but for this, but, If you are passing some law, you think whether it will be effective, whether it will help or not. BDS is a very serious phenomenon. It has no, nothing to do with the threat to Israel 
economical by court of Israel is laughable. We are the best economy in the world. Everybody wants to deal with us. And the fact that some university uh, will pass resolution by court in Israel means absolutely nothing. But our problem with BDS is different. It is, uh, as everything that's happening there in the campuses, as I say always to my, uh, my Shlichim, or until three months ago they were my Shlichim, but anyway, I continue in the, my public <coughs> capacity as the chairman of the Beit Sefer of Shlichim to deal with this. I always tell them, your aim is not to convince our enemies that we are good. Your aim is to convince Jews, young Jews of the campus, that they have nothing to be ashamed, they can be only proud of being connected to Israel. So, if that is our idea, that we have to strengthen Jews of the campus, how it can help for the Jew on the campus to feel proud for Israel when suddenly, just when this, the moment this law was passed, there was a bill that now every critic of Israel will not be able to go to birth rights. Of course, we then had to explain, we had to interpret the law, it doesn't include this. Then, okay, but any activist who dared to go to some meetings of J, J Street will not be permitted. Again, we had to explain. And then, this, what happened with this girl, it had to happen anyway, because the more there is law, and the politicians want to prove that it is, uh, it is effective law, they will be looking for somebody uh, to whom not to permit. And, and then they helped to, to turn a girl that nobody in the world knew and was interested in. She had, maybe she had some local influence on 10 people in her university. And now if she wants, she can become the leader of BDS movement in America. And she'll be very popular and thousands of people will join her and follow her. So the idea is, what is the use of it? How it helps us to, to make Jews on the campus more proud of Israel. And that's what I'm saying, that before we are passing such law, we have to, first of all, to think what is the problem with BDS, and we have a problem, and we have to fight. And then, what is it, whether this law helps to solve this problem or doesn't help. Okay. In, in, in both the case of BDS and the Kotel, um, are, are you sitting here, and are we sitting here, expecting um, idealistic or uh, the purest of motives from people who want to be elected and stay uh, in power and so on. I mean, I, I don't know, I mean, you know really well about what was going on with the Kotel uh, compromise. I don't know if the cabinet, if the coalition was going to fall over the, the, the Kotel deal. Um, I think it's unlikely, but I think maybe the Prime Minister thought, here's a way of, of impressing upon my ultra-Orthodox coalition partners that, that I'm their man, even when <laughs> my back isn't completely against the wall. In terms of the, of the BDS, I'm sure we have ambitious ministers who know that this plays to their audience. And maybe we just have to be realistic. Um, sometimes the, the wider interest of Israel and the diaspora is not going to play out the way we'd like it to, given domestic politics. Well, uh, who said it? I think people knew that all the politics are local. It's true that uh, if, if politician feels that it is good for his interests to insist on this or the other position, it's very difficult to move him or her from, from this position. So that is the problem. The, uh, for example, about the court. BB wanted very, well, I would say, compromise on court with all the efforts that I spent and the negotiations of a few years and, and other parties. It was Bibi's way. He called me, he said, it's impossible that Jews are fighting near the court, and let's find the solution. He, in all the critical moments, he entered the negotiations and was, I would say, very large during this negotiation, sometimes making promises which was very difficult to deliver. So he really wanted it. Why? Because he understood how it is important, but if he wants to be the leader of all the Jews in the world that he wants, and, and Israel has to be the leader of all the Jews in the world, he understood that he cannot ignore uh, 3,000 uh, communities of reform the conservative. Uh, the problem is that even if majority of Israelis feel that, why not? It's not an issue which they feel it's important. 
So when it comes to elections, this issue will, uh, the party will, which will run on the platform of relations with the reform, the conservative, will not get even one mandate. Not because uh, somebody is against, but we have real issues, economical, security issues, and this is nice to be. That is the problem. The problem is that majority of Israelis don't understand how hot this issue is for those Jews who feel very strongly about Israel, who go to APAC conference, by the way, when I said at the Gallant meeting that 85% of APAC are reformed the conservative, they couldn't believe it, because they think that it's kind of a small sect. So the fact that uh, such issues which are very important for one side are not the top priority for the other, that's the problem. Uh, again, I want to be also opposite. When I hear from my ministers or prime ministers, says, after all, unfortunately, when American Jews go to vote, Israel is not number one, is not number two, is not number three, by, your, by their uh, uh, data. And so, and unfortunately, uh, very little, and so why we have to make the interest number one priority if we are not number three or number four or number five? So I, I have to say I don't have easy answer. Uh, so it is really what we need, and that's why in the last year and a half in the Jewish agency we made a big effort on this. But we have to use the fact that we have shlichim who know diaspora and know Israel. They have now to explain diaspora to Israelis and of course vice versa. That's, we, we have to spend much more time on explaining one another to one another before we start fighting. I know that uh, President Rivlin today spoke about um, the, the idea of become some kind of a reverse birthright. Um, I guess. So, what do you think of that idea? Well, uh, first of all, he was right. Second, it's not a new idea. Uh, third, uh, already like uh, 20 years ago, only, uh, when I first came to the government, we were speaking that there's practical all. Almost all our soldiers after the army go for for a year to India, to Thailand. To the, let's find financial ways to encourage them to spend some time in Jewish communities. Uh, and you know, if you spend some time in the Jewish community on Los Angeles or San Francisco, maybe it's not as exciting as in uh, to be in India or today what is called the Peru or Chile or whatever. It's not as exciting. But it will be eye-opening, and that's very important. Yes, very important. Not only, well, of course, for birth rights is necessary for strengthening identity of American Jews because of the assimilation. All this, we don't have fear of assimilation of Israelis, but the fact that Israelis who feel very strongly about the Jews of the world know so little or understand so little the nature of the life the nature of the struggle against assimilation in the communities, whether it is in America or in England, it's a problem. By the way, I, I, um, I want you guys to ask questions as well. We, we'll try and leave plenty of time. So just be thinking of stuff that you want to ask, um, questions as opposed to speeches, of course, as they always uh, tell us to say. Um, just I, want, I would like to get your take on the uh, nation state law. Um, I thought we had this really good Declaration of Independence that they drew up <laughs> in, in, in pretty trying times, and I think they did a pretty good job of it. And um, for all the justifications that missing elements of the law are in other laws or are assumed to be in other laws, I just thought, why, why didn't they just encode the Declaration of Independence in our sort of uh, basic laws? Well, it's a good question. If you look why, then you have the answer whether it is good law or bad law. I was speaking at one conference recently, and I was asked, and all this conference was about importance of national law. And then when I was asked, I said, if I have to say in one word, it's good. If I can have to say in two words, it's not good. <laughs> so uh, in one word, why it is good? Look, uh, that, no doubt there is a huge effort in the world to delegitimize the idea of national state. It continues already for 30 years, and there's all this uh, multiculturalism, and uh, the idea that it's very good to 
living in the world without borders, or without nations, or without religions, where there is nothing to fight for. I quote, of course, John Lennon, imagine. And it seemed like a great dream. Sometimes I come to our president's uh, conference, some others, and there's uh, playing this song as if it is a great song, don't, without understanding that this song denies the idea of Jewish national state. And uh, then what happened with the world when Israel was created, the idea of the national state was a good idea because it was, it was obvious that for freedom and democracy it's good that people are united in their national states. But then, as a result of these two awful wars, it, uh, this idea of post-identity philosophy that we had enough wars because of nationalism and religious prejudices, let's get rid of all this. And the idea of national state is not a popular one. And there are many leaders in the West who believe that if all the Israel would stop insisting to be a Jewish state, then there'll be peace. And of course, it's very naive, it's very dangerous, and it's very wrong. So, and also the fact that Israel has a law of return, that uh, basic right, by the way, which many countries are using without even having such a law. When the Soviet Union fell apart, there are 150 nationalities in the Soviet Union, but came Germany and said, those who have German nationality, even if their great-grandparents came 350 years ago to Russia, they can automatically get citizenship in Germany. And nobody was arguing it. Well, only Germans and Jews said Germany, because they wanted to show the Jews are also welcome. And nobody argued that they have this right. About Israel, there is, on many campuses I heard, that the law of return means that you are apartheid state. It's absolute nonsense. But yes, we have to say it very clearly. We are a national state which has special obligations to Jewish people in gathering of exiles, law of return, continuity of Jewish people. It's our mission. That's good. That's good. Now, what is bad? From the very beginning, and that is said in the declaration, uh, the, uh, uh, yes, no, uh, uh, Magellan, Magellan, it's more, how you say, Declaration of Independence, that we are Jewish democratic state. And the balance, of the connection, there are all the time there are debates whether we are first democratic or we are first Jewish. And of course, there, uh, there is hot debate. I think on the level of law, by no means we should permit to look for a moment that first we are Jewish or first we are democratic. It has to go together. The fact that now we practically finished formulating our constitution and there are no words equality of all the citizens. And when they say no, no, but there are no words, but the law about dignity of, uh, uh, dignity of man, uh, the Supreme Court already said that they understand it as equality of citizens. So I understand on one hand, we are told that we cannot trust our Supreme Court. On the other hand, the same people are saying, we don't have to put in the law equality of citizens because the Supreme Court will understand it correctly anyway. I have to say, when I, again, I look through the eyes of my shaliyah of the campus, who has to make young Jews proud. And I was in more than 100 campuses. And I had a very difficult debate when uh, Israel is accused that we are apartheid uh, uh, state, or when there is a big audience, the young, young, very nice Palestinian girl comes and says, Israeli soldiers raped my mother. And I have to explain to these students who have a lot of sympathy to the girl, why it is lying. So there are different stations, but I know how to explain, how to, how to move it to the debate. How to explain when somebody says on the campus, you say you're a democratic state, and you are the only democratic state which doesn't have in the law equality of all the citizens? And then I have to explain, but we in fact have it uh, manned by Supreme Court, and we don't, didn't put it directly because we don't trust our Supreme Court. Nobody can understand. <laughs> Nobody, uh, it is how I cannot explain. How can I explain it directly? So that is my problem. And by the way, it doesn't mean that we have to cancel law. It is very important to have national law, but 
to have a clause on this law, on the previous law, uh, uh, the law about dignity, to have a clause that, of course, everything what is said here means or doesn't undermine the fact that there is full equality of all the citizens of Israel, uh, their civil rights. That's all what is needed, but it is very important. Okay, um, I have lots and lots of questions I want to ask you, and uh, we're not going to get to them all, and I want to have some questions for you guys. I want to ask you two more questions, one of which is, one of which is ridiculous to ask you, because there's no way you can answer it. Um, that's the second one. The first one, I don't know, uh, is a bit sort of Russia-related. So we're in a world now where it is alleged that um, all kinds of dirty deeds were done to try and skew the elections in the United States, uh, where, where the dark hand of Russia is seen in all kinds of uh, um, online, cyber, um, and actual warfare. I, I interviewed this, this phenomenal Israeli professor whose name is, uh, um, uh, uh, I think his name is Yitzhak Ben Yaakov, I always get his name wrong. He runs the Tel Aviv University um, uh, cyber uh, department. He set up a lot of Israel's cyber defenses, and he was speaking about the, 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 a mindset in Russia, I and mean, this military doctrine, the Maskirovka. You know, he said to me, they, go, they don't go to war without a strategic plan for deception, uh, disinformation, fake news. There's, there's a different mindset in Russia. And I just want your input on that. <laughs> well, no, first of all, I don't know whether it will disappoint you or make you proud. So I have to say, all this, uh, who is dealing with cyber in America? A lot of Jews. <laughs> Who is dealing with cyber in Russia? <laughs> a lot of Jews. So to say that it is different mindset, that Jewish mindset becomes different when they cross the border, though. The fact, the fact how you're using it, how you're using uh, your intelligence officers, whether you're using it in order to pr uh, protect your security or you're using it to interfere to the elections, it's already political decision of the politicians. And if somebody had any doubt that Russia, if it will have physical opportunity to, uh, to interfere, that it will not interfere. I never had such doubts. Uh, and by the way, I think some democratic parties also, countries, if they have such an opportunity, they will do it. So we have to make sure that our cyber protection is stronger than uh, cyber attack of any dictatorial regime and not so dictatorial regime. <laughs> okay, that was, that was the easier. My last question for you is, is just ridiculous and I apologize. Um, I, just, I just have the sense that, that we, as, as a race, um, are becoming increasingly polarized, increasingly intolerant, shorter attention spans, a growing resistance to contradictory narratives, basically that humanity's hurt them off a cliff, right? Uh, and I'd like you to tell me that I'm wrong, David, and you know it's really not so bad. Uh, you know the, the progress of humanity over the decades. So I'll elaborate to give you a bit more time to think. That's an impossible question. So I'll, I'll take it further that after World War II, at least in much of the free world, people were so horrified by the evidence of what we can do to each other that that they reached for their better impulses uh, and that uh, and sought to be more elevated. <laughs> And that in the last few years, really materialism and selfishness and, and well, anyway, I've generalized enough, you get the idea. Um, so I'm, I'm feeling pretty bleak well, about mankind. Yeah, Do you think that, <laughs> that, that humankind is moving in a positive or negative direction? That would be my summation. Well, first of all, uh, definition, what is positive and what is negative, it's also relative. So uh, it's, it's not, the, your question has nothing to do with the, to the relation between Israel and the Arts. It was about human race. Yes. And I'm not sure that I am a good specialist for this because. Uh, because well, no, no, you, you had to ask my grandchildren. Because I, because I really have to say that uh, when, uh, uh, when I look at the way how my grandchildren, who are uh, between five and uh, nine, how they are. Uh, dealing with the fact that they really don't have to learn by heart anything because everything is on the internet. But they have to understand their relation between Whether it is good or bad, I don't know, it's, it's very different. It's clear that 
you know, uh, when I was writing book, Fear No Evil, and some people said it was a very good book, but there were like 300 pages. I don't know anybody, young people who read more than 30 pages, more than three pages, more than Twitter. Uh, so we definitely, we have to start thinking how to express ourselves in a very different way. Whether it is good or bad, I don't know. For this, you have to ask somebody younger. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I was pretty good. It's, you know, I, I, by the way, five to nine, that's great. It's you know, 13 and 16 and 20 and so on, where it starts getting, anyway. Uh, guys, do you have questions that you're burning to ask? Uh, just raise your hands and I'll try and, and please. If you'd like to introduce yourself, it's not mandatory. By all means, stand up, say who you are, you are and where you're from. I want to ask you specifically about uh, Hock and Hemanuk, the loyalty law, or the uh, AKA Miri Regev law. And uh, before I say what I think, what is your opinion about it? Well, is it the law which passed or which didn't no, pass? No, that's not. So, there are many populist laws which are proposed, which are very good for campaign, for election campaign. If I, <laughs> I think it was a Victor Lieberman who was the first who made this case. Campaign for when, when he was elected, or when he became a minister, he didn't even think to bring it uh, to the vote. Well, uh, I don't remember how Miriam was about this. Uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, I don't, uh, of course, we need uh, loyal citizens, but they're becoming loyal because of the quality of life which they have and which they want to have, and uh, the life in Israel. As you, as the one who maybe are from Britain, I think you feel exactly as I do that the life in Israel is much more full, interesting, deep, meaningful, exciting uh, than even the life in England before this this lead of Labour Party. <laughs> uh, uh, so uh, that that's how we have to convince our citizens, and not by uh, forcing them to give different authors which, you know, the more adjectives you add to this, it's, uh, usually, uh, my criteria was, you know, the uh, Soviet Socialist People's Democratic Republics. <laughs> so the more additions you had, people's the democratic, the more totalitarian it was. So uh, I think the more dictatorial regime, the more he will be demanding from his citizen to put authors about freedom and democracy. We don't need it. <laughs> yes, anybody else? Gentlemen in the back. Hi, I'm Major Rosenthal, I'm from Phoenix, Arizona. Um, since this conversation is about Israel at 70, I was wondering what you think the biggest threat to Israel is in the next 70 years, whether it be external with Iran or with BDS or internal in some way. Well, Seventy, right? Yeah. Spawn, right? Nine English months. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, I'm seventy, but I spent, as you said, a decade in prison, and I strongly feel that this decade is not counted. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so uh, in ten years, I can tell you how it is feel, felt to be at seventy. Uh, now, as um, you know, we unfortunately, uh, since uh, Kadosh Baru stopped talking to us, so the prophecy is not our strong part, though Garrison did predict uh, Israel State. Uh, I believe that our biggest challenge is our internal challenge. How we continue living as one people with this Zionist, in, uh, look, for all the previous for 2,000 years, we didn't have this challenge. But now we, have, thanks God, have the state of Israel. And state of Israel, in the beginning, Yeltsin predicted. He predicted state, but he also predicted that the more there is state, everybody all will move to Israel or will assimilate. And by, by the way, he felt okay with both options. But he said simply, that's the way how every Jew will be saved. Or move to Israel or assimilate. We know it's not the case. Half of the people, lives in Israel, half of the people does live in Israel. 
we have to find the way how, and the, as the head of Jewish agency, of course, I strongly, and not as, as a Zionist, I strongly believe that that is the be best choice. But I also understand that for generations to come, there will be a very big part of Jewish people who will not live in Israel. Where they will find a way to continue living as one people with one mutual uh, aim of continuing our march in history together, or not, that's a big question. <coughs> and it's a big question not for 70 years from now, it's a big question for the next 70 years. And that I believe is the biggest challenge. Because I'm optimist, I believe that with the threat of Iran, it's a big threat, and Prime Minister is right that the last 20 years he believed that that is his main mission. He's right, it's a big threat. We are a very strong country and we know how to deal with it. BDS, it's not a threat. BDS, in fact, is a threat to what I just said. But the young generation of Jews will feel themselves closely connected to Israel. But again, that's in our hands to deal with it. Yeah, anybody else? Please. I want to ask you about, not about Soviet Jewry, but about uh, the former chairman of the Jewish Agency. What's happened now in England, the chairman of the Labour Party, and the Labour Party itself has become so hostile toward Israel, and they have raised the Palestinian flag in the Labour Party conference. Yesterday it was a big headline that 40% of uh, British Jewry are planning to make Aliyah. Do you think it's a realistic number? Do you think that the whole, uh, whatever the problem is, a realistic one or just a uh, uh, headline? Can you repeat the question? Yeah, well, not in all of its nuances, but basically yes. it's all about England. Um, <laughs> the Labour Party, the Palestinian flag, raised at that conference, sporting us. The survey, it, it's 40% of Anglo jury saying they might consider relocating if Corbyn became Prime Minister or something like that. Your, your take on that? Yeah. Well, uh, first of all, really something very important happened with British jury. Uh, two years ago, I was saying on many forums that look what happened with French jury, and uh, it's happened six, seven years ago when Polls, French polls, started showing that half of French Jews, half of French Jews believe that the future of their children will not be in France. It doesn't mean that they are going to make it there, but the fact that half of French Jews, and it is the biggest Jewish community, 600,000 people, is in fact is on the march. And that's a big, great opportunity for Israel and so on. That's what was, and in those times I was saying it's really unique that the only big Jewish community in Europe which feels strongly that they are British first, that they are proud representatives of the British tradition, maybe even British colonies, I don't know. But uh, it is uh, because French Jews don't feel that they are uh, representatives of Napoleon uh, or French uh, Revolution. And, uh, well, not, not speaking, of course, about Russian Jews and uh, East European Jews and so on. And the only who feel very strongly that they are part of British Empire, and of course they are Jews, but uh, Britain first, we are British Jews. That's how I felt. So I really believe that the, uh, well, all, all what was happening in Europe with the terrorism, with the, uh, with Muslim terrorism and with, tolerance of the society to this, and, uh, uh, and, and finally, anti-Semitism <coughs> coming to the highest echelons of Labour Party influences them. Uh, what's the difference between British Jews and American Jews? American Jews are Democrats, Democrats, Democrats. Many of them say that we are Democrats, that's why we are Jewish. Uh, uh, in uh, England, you had three, four generations who voted Labour, and they abandoned it. They are no, not voting. Majority of British Jews now say 80% so that they will not vote Labour. So it, it, it by itself shows that their Jewishness is more important to them than loyalty to one another British party. Having said all this, and that's really very interesting and new phenomenon with British Jewry, all these statements of Israeli leaders now that is the time immediately for them to come and so on. I would say make less statements and do more to attract them. 
we are losing a lot of big part of French Elia only because our uh, government is not capable to change the situation to recognize all the diplomas of French Jews and we are losing a lot of them for this because they can go to New York and their uh, diplomas will be recognized that very moment and uh, here they have to wait for many years. And the fact that it's the first time that we don't have any ben benefits for New Olim in buying apartments for the first time. And when the apartments are so expensive, and there are so many French Jews who tell me, I check the market, if I don't have $200,000 in cash, uh, I will not have apartment for my uh, two children, not only in Tel Aviv, but I will not have it also uh, in Beersheba. And, and I have $150,000 in the bank account, so when I'll make another $100,000, I'll make a year. So the fact that we as a government, speaking for so many years how we want all these Jews, cannot create some kind of special mortgage for New Alim for, uh, that can come and that this mortgage will turn to the monarch. That's, by the way, something what I remember how, when our Aliyah came, I was doing such deals with Arik Sharon in five minutes. But then, of course, Arik Sharon was not scared by the Supreme Court and by anything else. So I don't recommend us to follow his, <laughs> his, his dealing with the law. But the fact that we cannot find legal ways, because I would tell him, no, we cannot do it for French Jews, we have to do it for everyone. He said, okay, do it for everyone. No, we cannot do it for those Alim who came in the last year, we have to do it for all the Alim who came in the last 100 years. Of course, then, uh, uh, if instead of uh, making declaration that 40% of Jews of Britain will come, we will make some real steps, and as a result, 5% of British Jews will come. That will be a huge change. Is there one last burning question that somebody had? And last question, then I'll run it up. You, you really, you ignored... Oh, were, they, were their hands up yeah, up yeah. there? You ignored them. Uh, were, yeah. were their hands up? Yeah, there were a lot of hands. Was there hands? Yeah. So I, I can't not ask you yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, so we'll do... We'll what, what? Choose among yourselves and we'll guess. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Currently, Russia doesn't seem to be so anti-Israel as the Soviet Union was. Well, you think currently Russia does not seem to be so anti-Israel? British people, just tell us. <laughs> <laughs> I actually chose all the Brits. The truth is that. Yes. Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> do, do you think this is the Putin effect, or do you think there's been a change in heart in Russia? Yeah. Is, is Russia less anti-Semitic? Look, or less anti-Israel? Uh, 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 he was. Uh, uh, about anti-Semitism, but okay. Uh, first of all, uh, you, you know I was activist of two movements uh, in the Soviet Union, human rights movement and Zionist movement. So as the activist of human rights movement, I can't say anything good about Putin. As the activist of Jewish movement, I have to say, for the first time in thousand years of history of uh, Russia, there is a leader who loves Jews. Why it happened? So, with a long story, he will can tell us a lot of stories about his neighbor Jews in St. Petersburg and that. No, but every anti Semite also has friends Jews and it doesn't help. He really uh, has sympathy to Jews. More than this, he, what he told me in the year 2000, in the very beginning when we were on speaking terms, uh, <laughs> he told me that it was a big mistake that Soviet Union thought that. Uh, independent Jewish communities are bad for us. I really believe they can be our bridge to the world. And here, I have to say, and now I also have experience of nine years of being the head of Jewish agency, we never had any problems in our huge operation. Uh, and even if sometimes in one city, some local KGB, whatever, is threatening to Jewish community, you complain to Moscow, and uh, you know, uh, Russia is a very simple country. The, uh, everybody understands what the leader wants. So, when, uh, we also have to understand that, uh, ah, and, uh, so what is Israel for Putin? Israel is Jewish, Russian-speaking country. So he really, <laughs> he really loves it. <laughs> now, the fact that even for a moment, it will not change his position that he needs Iran and Syria against uh, America, and that's why he has his strategic interests, and that's why Israel should better not cross his ways on this. 
that's a big problem, big problem. And I think the fact that we sometimes think that we can solve problems with Russia without using big support of his opponent in America, I think it's a mistake. Okay. Really, because that's another session, I think. Yeah. So, well, I don't know, decide between the two of you. No, Who's, whose first. question is more important? Women first. Well, ladies first. Nathan said I have to choose the... the okay. Oh, she, but, she, but, she, but she voted for him. Okay. She voted for him, okay. Did you? Question? Okay, okay uh, I'm also British. <laughs> yes, this <laughs> one. <laughs> Okay, in England you have God Save the Queen nationality. In America, in the politics in America, God comes up very central in all uh, politics. In the national, in the in the law, the nation state law, we talk about history, the reasons for Israel's connection to Jewish people, the history, cultural, and then religion, political reasons, the admin as well. Why in Israel do you think we're embarrassed? as a nation to talk about God and the connection to Jewish people. you got like 20 seconds, not this yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, no, by the way, it's a, it's a good question, really, because I have to say, uh, when I was in prison and I entered the prison uh, thinking about God as something uh, very rational, I had a very good conversation with God and with King David in prison, and they were very rational, serious conversations. And when I came to Israel from the airport, uh, Reagan called and Schultz called, and some people said, Oh, he's not excited at all. I told you, I, I, I was expecting that God will call me. I had conversations all the time with him. So I really believe that we Jewish people are very lucky to be chosen people. And whether God chose us or we chose God, it doesn't matter. <laughs> but what to do? It's, uh, many Israelis are very prejudiced. They think that the moment God is mentioned, it's, it's uh, in positions, uh, kviadati. And uh, this became a big issue, kviadati, radada, and all this nonsense. Uh, I think that uh, uh, we, we are the people who had the most balanced relations uh, between religion and, uh, and uh, our secular mission. And somehow, because of our political battles, uh, it was uh, somehow uh, undermined. Uh, I have to say, uh, in our family, we don't have this problem, and uh, uh, we are coming to compromise very easily. Uh, and I think that uh, the less politics we have, the, the better. But to put it in the law, it's politics. So why do you need to put it in the law? Put it in your daily life. Okay. Okay. And on that elevated spiritual note, thank you everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just to read out the last and final session for this evening. Yes, it never ends at Limoj. We have between uh, in this room. Investing in Shared Destiny, Economics, and the israel diaspora Relationship. That is with Michael Friedman, Joanna Landau, Alan Lifshitz, and Avi Weiss. We have, next door in Diesendorf, Ruth Calderon on the Long Distance Relationship.